Uh, for 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8 says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for Paul. I thank you for his life and how once he got saved, he was all in. He went 110% to serve you in every which way that you gave him the opportunity to do that. God, I just pray that I share this message that it would only be your words that are heard and nothing else that I might say that might confuse or, or be silly. I just pray that it would be clear and accurate and we'd all be challenged today to live our lives to the fullest to serve you in every which way we can. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you, see, when you hear the phrase, a fight to the death, I don't know what comes to mind. Um, my brother makes these pictures, and this is kind of what I pictured. I pictured two guys dueling with swords. And they're, they're on rocky terrain, and they're, they're, they're dueling, and they're sweating, and they're just duking it out. And they know at whatever point that I lose my sword, or whatever point I fall down, I'm a dead man. Right? I, and i got to fight with everything that I am in order to live. Has anybody ever seen uh, Princess Bride? Yes. yes? Okay. So you got Domingo Montoya, and you got the masked man up there, on, way up there in this big rock, rocky hill, and they're just diving and flight, uh, flipping and all sorts of things, but they're fighting to the death. And that's what I picture. But fighting to the death isn't just with swords. You know, fighting to the death... Fighting to the death, people do this all the time. People fight to the death for our country. You know, we, we had Memorial Day weekend uh, a couple weekends ago. And there were people who went to war, and they did whatever it took. And they fought, and they shot as long as it took until they finally, their life ended. Because they were fighting to the death to give us freedom. There's people who fight to the death in order to protect a loved one. You know, if, if my kid is drowning and he cannot swim, I'm going to risk my life and do whatever it takes to rescue my kid. If my kid's getting kidnapped, I'm going to be using every ounce of my everything to stop that. I don't care what happens to me, I'm going to fight to the death to make sure that he is okay. As people will fight to the death in life, just to keep life the way it is. People will do it to keep their land, their way of living, however their life system goes, they're going to do whatever it takes to make it happen. Well, there's only so much time in life that you can fight to the death. At some point, time is going to end and your fight is done. Win or lose the situation, your battle is done. So point number one we see from Paul today is that each one of us has a time of departure ahead of us. At some point, we are going to leave this earth. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 6, he says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure has come. Ever since the moment Paul got saved, he was all in for the Lord. He went from, I can't see, and from persecuting Christians to promoting the faith and going everywhere to share the name of Jesus. And throughout the book of Acts, as we've been going through that, there are numerous times Paul could have died. He was getting beaten. He was getting put in prison. He was stoned and left for dead. But he lived through all of that because the day and the time of his departure was not going to come a moment sooner than what God had designed for Paul's life to do. Now currently when Paul's writing this, he is in a prison in Rome. I think many of you have heard about Nero uh, in 64 AD. He decided, according to what I hear in history, he's Little mental decided to burn the, the city of Rome, and then, uh-oh, I, I, I can't take the blame for this. i got to blame somebody. So he blames the Christians. So now all of a sudden, Christians are getting rounded up, in prison, tortured, and put to death publicly. And Paul is one of those guys who got tagged from a different colony and brought to Rome in order to face that same kind of punishment. And so his time of departure is getting close. In chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, he says, In my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. And so you find that Paul has had kind of his preliminary hearing. You know, you go to trial, you, you get your preliminary hearing before you get your sentence. And that is what is happening with Paul. He's already had like a kind of a first trial, and he's going to get sentenced. Oh, and he's very confident he is going to get the death sentence. 
And it, it, he's okay with this. He says, this is the completion of my work. This is the final sacrifice that I can give to God. This is not a loss. This is a good thing because I get to go to heaven. Paul was not afraid of death. Why? Why wasn't Paul afraid of death? He's most certainly going to die. He wasn't afraid of death because he knew where his hope lied. He knew his hope lied in Jesus for salvation. It wasn't based off of anything that he did. It was only Jesus. He put his faith in him for salvation. So he says, I'm ready to go. Paul was not worried because Paul had lived his life running his race as hard as he could for the Lord. So he had nothing to be ashamed of. He was going to, to meet Jesus face to face soon. And he says, I am ready to go. Paul's time of departure was at hand. And he says, I'm ready. Well, I, I'm here to tell you that your time of departure is going to come. You're all living and breathing here now. But at some point, that is going to stop. You know, I like to say, you know, the younger you are, the longer you have to live. You know, you like to say you got the little infants here that they could live for the next 80 years. But we already know that sometimes the young die young and the old die older. There is no set limit lifespan that you get to have and guarantee life comes and goes as God gives and takes life away. And some of you are probably going to get advanced warning. Some of you are probably going to go to the doctor at some point, and you know that ache or that pain or that lump that you have that none of us know about? The doctor might come in and say, you know what, Josh? That is cancer. And I'm sorry, I can't do anything about that. And based off of what I know from my medical experience, that's going to be give you six months to live. I, I'm, we're all in tears. I hate to tell you that, but Josh, you have six months to live. There's some advanced warning, and assuming something else doesn't take you out in life first, You've got six months to make things right with, with God and to try to get your affairs in order. But there's a lot of people who are going to die unexpectedly. You know, uh, I, I did a little research and find out, found out that 90 people a day die in car wrecks. 90 people in America a day. Now, that's, that's a little concerning because Noah's 16 and a half. We just had him for 16 years and he was completely fine, put him out in a car and he may not come back home from work tomorrow because he might be one of those 90 people who die in a car wreck. Uh, Nate's brother, thankfully, was fine, but it could have easily been the people that he hit. There could be a statistic right now. They say that about one-eighth of people die in their sleep. A lot of those people went to bed expecting that tomorrow was going to come. Every time I go to sleep, I expect tomorrow to come. Every day it has, but I, I'm expecting it. And and so there's a, a huge number of people who are going to die in their sleep expecting to wake up and have everything okay. Here's how I'm probably going to die. I'm probably going to die of some kind of accident. If you knew my history and my <laughs> who I am, you'd be surprised sometimes of what I am got out of. But 200 and, almost 201,000 people are going to die because of an accident. Not a car accident, but like falling off a ladder accident, falling off a roof accident. Oh, I accidentally shot myself. You know, things like that. Almost 201,000 people die a year from an accident. Totally unexpected that that was going to take place. I did a little research, not the greatest research, and I don't know if you can read this or not. It's kind of small. But it says 56 million people are going to die every single year. 56 million people. That's over 4 million people uh, a month. That's over 150,000 a day, over 6,000 people an hour, uh, a minute. Over 100 people are going to die every single minute. And please don't do that today in here, okay? Um, per second, almost two people are going to die every single second. And the majority of those people did not know that was coming. It was unexpected. So you have a time of departure coming. And, and that's just the way life is. And then some of us who may not die... It, you know, because Jesus is going to come back. You know, but he, if he came back right now, we wouldn't die before we went to heaven. We'd go to heaven with a brand new body, but we, we would go living. But that even that's going to be unexpected. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, after, it says, after those who have passed away uh, are raised with the trumpet call of God. So Erna, she passed away. She's going to rise first. If Jesus came back today, that trumpet call is going to blow Ern is going to rise first, and then we are going to join her up in the air. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 
uh, 51 and 52, and it says, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, unexpectedly, without warning. By the time it's happened, it's done. There's no like, I'm watching you disappear and you're disappearing. It's just like, boom, you're done. Unexpectedly, you have a time of departure, whether you die or whether Jesus comes and raptures you and takes you home. You have a certain day, a certain month, a certain hour when your departure time is going to come. There is a ticket that you cannot see that's, that you're going to take and it's going to get punched and you're going to be out of here. And Paul says, uh, kind of says, this is what I did. I knew my departure time was coming. This is what you do up until that departure time. He says, I fought a good fight. Uh, I'm sorry. He says, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So point number two is, so number one, you have a day of departure coming. Like it or not, know what it is or not, it is going to come. What are you supposed to do in the in-between time? You're supposed to fight a good fight of faith before that day of departure. And Paul can say, I did it. I fought it. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. He doesn't say, uh-oh, I should have done this for the Lord. If I had more time from now on, since I'm, I'm about to die here, if I had more time, I would do that. He says, I have already done this. He's looking back in his life, and he knows the things that he's done for the Lord. Paul fought a good fight. Uh, the, the word is translated uh, to mean to engage in conflict, and it's com as in competing in athletic games or in a military conflict. Now, he wasn't literally fighting with the sword. He wasn't literally running a race like you see here, but he was living that Christian faith to, to that extent. Now, think about the guy who's dueling with the sword or he's in a, a, a gunfight with the enemy overseas and everybody's shooting. How hard are you going to try to stay alive? You got a wife and kids or a husband and friends at home you want to go see. How hard are you going to try to win that battle? Pretty stinking hard. Right? If, if it's me, I'm going to be, I'm going to be ducking, I'm going to be looking, I'm going to be sweating, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to have whatever it is to, to win that battle. Now, if you're in a race and you want to win the prize, or you're playing basketball and you're hoping to win the game, how hard are you going to try? Are you going to be like, I'm dribbling the ball, I'm passing the ball, I'm just got, get, going like this down the court. You're running down the race, you're trying to win. You're going to put every ounce of every muscle. You're going to have stretched and practiced, and you're going to run as hard as you can to win that race. That's how Paul lived the Christian life. He wasn't like, oh, I'm sort of telling someone about Jesus, and I don't really care, and I'm sort of doing this. He was all in on what it was that God gave him to do. So he could say, I have fought the good fight. He did his very best. Paul finished the race. Now, Paul was given a very difficult race to run. You know, it wasn't a, a difficult track, but there was a plan that God had for Paul's life that you can look, like, look at as a race. And every, each one of us, God has some kind of race, some kind of direction he wants us to go that is your race. And it's not going to look the same as anybody else's. Paul had a very difficult track ahead of him. Some of what he had to endure on his race, you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He says, he says, pick a different book, Josh. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. He says, I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged uh, more severely and exposed to death again and a day, again. Five times I received the Jew, from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open seas. And he goes on and on about this difficult race he had to run. But he says, I finished it. I did everything that I was going to do. Chances are you're not going to get put in prison. Chances are you're not going to get flogged. You're not going to face these kinds of things like Paul did. But that was the race that God gave him. It was his race, and he ran it well to the very end. In Acts 20, verse 24, which we're going to be looking at next week when we're back in the book of Acts, here was kind of like Paul's mission. Acts 20, 24. He says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me 
If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. At that point, he was still running that race. He was not done yet. He wasn't across that finish line. And that was his goal. It's like, I don't, I'm just going to keep pressing on uh, and, and try to complete the, the mission God gave me of telling everybody about Jesus. And Paul kept the faith. Now, there's different views on what it means to keep the faith, but what makes the most sense to me was that Paul never gave up on God. Paul, through thick and thin, says, I'm going to keep my faith in Jesus no matter what it costs me. Now, if you think about getting put in prison and beaten with rods and whipped and stoned and all those different things I just read, how many people would say, oh, I want to give up? Right? Yeah. Honestly, that Caleb's raising his hand. That's me. I'd be like, how much more do I got to go through? He had people desert him at, at this point in, while he's in jail. Like, this is your fault, Paul. Because of something about how you're living your life, you kind of deserve this. And Paul's like, I am not going to give up. I'm going to stay true to the very end. He says, my, my, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. Like that liquid is falling out of that cup. And as soon as that cup is empty, my life is done. Now that drink offering was something that was poured out at the base of the altar before a lamb sacrifice was sacrificed or, or on the lamb. But once that's gone, that sacrifice is done. And that's where Paul says, I'm at. My, my life is, I, I'm seeing it slip away from me. I, I'm watching the, 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 the clock. I know that I'm about done. And so he can say that I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And through it all, Paul says, I am not going to give up on God. What I'm getting far outweighs what I have gone through. And so I'm going to keep the faith. You know, we... You and I, the, peop, the person that all of you are looking at, the, peop, the, per, the people that I'm looking at, all of us should be the people who are just like Paul, who says, I am fighting the good fight. I am finishing the race. I am keeping the faith. Now, it's, it's pretty easy to start something new. You know, I, I, I'll tell you, yesterday when we were painting, it was, it was pretty easy to start. You know, we have, we have people showing up. We're all full of energy. There's a little bit of excitement of, hey, the color's changing. But you know what? By the end, guess who was tired? Guess who wanted to quit? <laughs> it's, it's easy to start painting. It's easy to start a new routine or a new weight loss program or a new exercise program. But after that first day and those muscles are sore, I don't think I want to do that anymore. Paul wasn't a guy who just says, I'm going to start well. He was a guy who was going to finish well. So let me ask you, what fight are you fighting? What race are you running? What is it that God's specifically asking of you to do? Now, there's, there's, I have about five things that I'm going to put up here. And the first one is what everybody's, was probably coming to everybody's mind. Is what is God saying specifically of you? You know, we, God asked me to be a pastor. God asked the, the Sparks to be missionaries. God's asked Nicole to be a teacher and Nick to be a cop, right? God's asked something specific of you, uh, but there's a lot of kids in here who are going to grow up. What is it God's asking you to do? You don't know, but that's what we want to know. If I'm going to follow God and fight my race and run my course, what is it that God wants me to do? But there's a lot more everyday things that are more involved in, than just that one big thing that God's asking you to do. Fighting your good fight, running your race, is saying no to the sin and temptations that show up every day in your life. And that's a constant race. That's a constant battle. That's a constant take my eyes off of this and get my eyes on Jesus. How are you doing it running that part of your race? Saying no to these things that you got to deal with every day of your life. How are you doing at being obedient to what you already see in Scripture? I'm supposed to love my enemies. I'm going to pray for those who persecute me. I'm supposed to share the faith. I'm supposed to spend time serving in ministry and going to church. I'm supposed to um, all sorts of things. How are you doing with the things that you already see in Scripture? Not because a preacher said it, but because you see it in Scripture. How are you doing with those things? How are you running that race and, and keeping that, that race run well? How are you at enduring the hardships that are associated with following God's word? You try to make the right choice and it's costing you. How are you doing with that? Are you giving up? Are you saying it's not worth it? 
Um, I told you a couple weeks ago about the, the stand that Leslie and I took about a married couple living together, both claiming to be Christians, and this great big blow up on Thanksgiving. You know, that's not something that you get excited about and want to ever do again. But how are you doing? You're, if you're going to live a godly life, you're going to be persecuted. Are you going to be the person who says, I'm going to keep going with what God's asked me to do, even though it's hard? How are you doing at maintaining your commitment to your ministry? You know, we had a lot of faithful VBS people here every single day. And I know they were tired. And I know that they were busy. And I know that they have all manner of life out there to deal with. But they were here every single day on time doing what it was that God asked them to do. You know, because if all of a sudden Nicole didn't do that story, I'm swimming. I'm in big trouble trying to prepare that. You know, Nick did an object lesson, and Jason did one. If all of a sudden, no, Jason didn't. He did the verse, or helped with the verse. But if all of a sudden Nick doesn't show up, i got to stand in there for five minutes and try to on the spur do this. And so we are a body working together. So part of running your race is just saying no to sin. It's just saying yes to what you already didn't know. It's, it's maintaining faithfulness, and it's enduring the hardships that go with following Jesus as you're running your race. So there's lots of things involved in it besides just that one big thing that you want to know that God's asking you to do. So we should be the people who run a good race. We should be the people who fight a good fight. Paul encourages Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, and I think he would do the same thing to you. He says, hey, Timothy, you're, you're starting out well, but you need to finish well. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, boy, Josh, I, I haven't done that great. I look at this list and I pick out that one and I haven't done too hot. You know, and that's, that's fine. You know, if you say, I stunk at all five of those, that's okay. You know what? If you said, I did everything right on that list, Josh, I'm the, I'm the poster child for that. That's nice. Okay, here's what you got to remember. This is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brothers, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of the, the prize, but one thing I do, I forget what's behind. You know, if you stunk at that list for the last 20 years of your life, who cares? Do you know why? Because you can't do anything about it. If you were awesome at that list for the last 20 years, who cares? You can't, you, you, you got to keep going. He says, I'm forgetting what's behind. I'm straining towards what's ahead. I'm pressing on towards the goal to win the prize as if there's only one and I want that prize. So sink or swim, good or bad, forget what's behind and press on and say, I'm going to be a new person from this point on. So Paul kept the, he ran, the, he kept, he kept the fight. He ran the race and now there's stored up for him a crown of righteousness. Okay. Let me back up here for a second. When you have slides, you got to use them. I know sometimes it is hard to be consistent in running the Christian life because sometimes you're, you're living your life and you're doing what God's asking you to do and you're not seeing the results of it. You don't see the temptation getting easier to avoid. You don't see the persecution benefiting you with any kind of reward. You don't see anything good coming out of any of it. And it's easy to, to give up the faith. When you're facing persecution from every side from trying to do the right thing, and when you feel like you're all alone, I just spent the whole week in VPS. Nobody got saved. Nope. There's no difference in anybody's life. You could get discouraged and you feel like God's not even saying, good job, Nicole. Good job, Nick. Good job, Marcia and Jason. Don't worry about it. Keep the faith. Keep trusting God. Uh, because if you run the race well in the temporary here on earth, if you run faithfully, it says you will be rewarded for all eternity. That's kind of how it works. We're running the race now. And Paul says we're going to be rewarded in, in eternity. He's going to get the crown of righteousness. So run it well. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Don't worry about if you're not feeling the benefit of this now. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. You will be rewarded. Paul says after your time of departure... Uh, this is what's going to happen. It says, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only also to me, <coughs> but also to you who have longed for his appearing. Paul had a crown of righteousness waiting for him when he got to heaven. 
Now there's some debate on what that's going to look like. Is he going to get like an olive branch crown that he's going to wear on his head? I mean, he's not going to get a kingly crown like, like what, you might, what Jesus might have, but he's, he's going to, he, is he going to get an olive branch crown on his head? Is that only for those people who finished and ran the race well? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It could just be the righteousness of God that you get in your life and you're perfect for all eternity because of God's righteousness. But the point is, you are going to be rewarded for your work here on earth. For how faithfully you ran your ministry or for what you did for the Lord, God is going to reward you when you get to heaven. And he says, you know, in a race, like if we went outside and had a foot race, not everybody's going to get a trophy. I know it wouldn't be me. <laughs> um, but there's going to be one trophy. But when you get to heaven, it's not like there's only the best Christian is going to get something and the rest of us are going to have to go, darn, I wish I would have tried harder. Everybody who runs that race well is going to get that same crown of righteousness. And it says, all those who have longed for his appearing. You know, if you're looking for Jesus to come back or if you want Jesus to come back, you're going to live your life a whole lot differently than people who say, I don't care if Jesus comes back. I don't think he's going to come back any soon. Uh, anytime soon. You know, there, there's parables in that in the New Testament about people who are, who are being lazy for the Lord because they're not expecting the, the master to come back soon. And it says how good it is when I, when I come and I find my servant actively working, doing what it was that I've asked them to do. And when you, when you are faithful to your work, to what God's called you to do, when you have your time of departure and you get to heaven, you are going to be rewarded. You're going to be working now hard in the temporary, and it's going to hurt, and it's going to get hard, and there's going to be persecution. But when you die, you're going to meet Jesus, and you're going to be rewarded. You know, I think, I can't help but think about Erna, you know, and, and some of the things I've heard about her and what she did in her life. And now I'm like, she's, at, she's at, at, in heaven with Jesus. Life is perfect. She's running. She's laughing. She's with all her loved ones now. She, she fought the good fight. She finished the race. And guess what? Now it's time to celebrate forever. You know, we talked, I feel like I've talked a lot about death and eternity and that kind of thing. And I want to take the moment just to, to ask you the question. Like Jason, you know, uh, if you're going to stand, if, when, you, when you die and if you stand before Jesus at the pearly gates and he says, why should I let you into heaven? What are you going to say? Are you going to say, well, I went to church a few times. I, I helped with the VBS program, or I gave money to some people at a, at a corner on a, with a bus stop so they can take a trip back home. I'm going to say I fought in a war. I, uh, you know, I, I got a special award. I was the, like the town favorite person. Or you're going to say, you know what? I put my faith in Jesus. Jesus is the only way to heaven. John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we've got to stop before we can say we're going to do anything for the Lord. We've got to make sure we know the Lord. And so I hope you can say, yes, I put my trust in Jesus as my Savior. And if you can't, why not? Because you don't believe it. You don't know what to say. If you want to talk to somebody at any point, please come talk to me. Talk to anybody else in here and say, what do I do? What do I need to know in order to have salvation? Because you have a day of departure coming. You might get six months warning. Or you might wake up dead tomorrow morning. You have no idea when that time is going to come. Are you ready to meet Jesus? For those of us, including myself, who have already put my trust in Jesus for salvation, how are you running the race? Are you running well? Are you putting everything you have into what God's asked you to do? Are you saying no to temptation? Are you, are you willing to put into practice what you already see in Scripture? Are you willing to do that one big thing that God has called you to do in life? Uh, whatever that else was on that list. How are you running uh, as far as your Christian faith goes? Because you will be rewarded for how well you do that. I just want to encourage you to run the race well. You know, if you run it well in the temporary, right now, you, put, you do what God's asked you to do. Whether it feels like it's monumental or whether you feel like it's just a couple minutes long, do what God's asked you to do. He's going to reward you. Run well in the temporary and be rewarded for all eternity. Let's pray. God, I thank you for Paul's ministry. God, I thank you that he was a guy who was all in on following you. God, he didn't let man stop him. He didn't let his fear stop him. He didn't let persecution. He didn't let anything get in the way of doing what you've asked him to do. God, I know that you've asked each of us to do something, whether it's that one big thing 
or whether it's just being faithful to what we already know in Scripture and saying no to sin, to being faithful even when we're facing persecution, God. I just pray that, God, we would be people who fight the fight well and we run the race. And we can, we can be just like Paul at the end of his life that can say, I fought the good fight, I ran the race, I have kept the faith. Help us to be that kind of people. For those of us who feel like, man, I haven't done as well as I should have, please help us to forget that. For those of us who think we've done well, help us to forget that. Help us just to press on from this point forward to do our best to serve you in whatever it is that you've asked us to do. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.